Indigenous communities are on the impact and receiving end of massive extraction zones, um, you know, a lot of environmental degradation. So we're living the, the consequences of what a lot of time is unseen by other communities and other urban centers and people that don't live near extraction sites. Um, so, you know, we receive the impact and the burden of toxicity and as well as just like sometimes not clean air, clean water, all of the things of what that looks like and as well as cultural, um, just like the cultural and like environmental genocide where it's like really impacting people on a very fundamental level. Welcome to Magabe Sessions. I'm your host, Magabe founder, Rhett Butler. In this series, we'll be interviewing some of the world's leading conservation thinkers and doers about their experiences and what can be done to make the world a better place. Thank you for watching. And I hope you enjoy. So I want to start with a background question. Um, where are you from and where do you live? Yeah, Tanze Gwakia. My name is Melina Miawapen Lubukan Maso and Yeni Hiao Kinespuntanawa. I am Lubukan Cree from Northern Alberta. So I was born in a small indigenous community that is called Little Buffalo, and it's in the territory of my nation, which is the Lubukan Cree. And that is pretty far north, um, north of the medicine line, as we call it, in so-called Canada. And that is, um, if you've been to, say, Calgary, it's about eight hours north of there. So it's quite a, a long distance. Um, so it's in the northern part of a place called Alberta, which is sometimes we call like little Texas. Um, so you're you're engaged in quite an impressive number of initiatives um, between founding Sacred Earth Solar, hosting a TV series, being a fellow at the David Suzuki Foundation, um, so could you talk about what you're working on now across these roles and these and activities and kind of what your focus is? But I, yeah, so I founded Sacred or Solar um, in 2015. I was very concerned as an Indigenous climate campaigner um, working on uh, fossil fuel extraction um, and like trying to uh, push for an end to extractivism in our traditional territories because of just the immense impacts that we were feeling from water uh, contamination, air pollution, massive deforestation of the boreal forest, which is the northern lungs of Mother Earth, um, health, major health issues on our communities and peoples across the north um, because the tar sands, which is what I campaigned on for a decade plus what is one of the biggest industrial extraction zones on the planet. So we, you know, we feed into the addiction of Canadian and US oil. Um, and so, yeah, there's a, there's, it's a major, a major impact zone and that's where I was born. And so, um, yeah, my first, my first um, protest was when I was seven when there was a, made, a big roads being built into our territory. So it's a, something, a work that I've inherited. Um, and when we had a major oil, oil spill back home, I realized, wow, I need to really start building what a transition, what does transition technology look like? What does a just transition look like in our communities? And that's why I founded Sacred or Solar, which um, I focus with my master's degree, degree did a thesis on uh, implementing a 20.8 kilowatt system, which powers the health center in the community of Little Buffalo, where I was born. And that was the foundation of Sacred Earth Solar. And then I have also since have done research with the David Suzuki Foundation, which is um, where I researched on indigenous knowledge, climate change and renewable energy. And then also just finished um, filming a TV show and it's now airing here in so-called Canada. It's called Power to the People and it's about renewable energy, eco-housing and food security across Turtle Island in Indigenous communities. And then also, as I said in the beginning, uh, co-founder of Indigenous Climate Action where I currently serve as the Just Transition Director. And I'm working on, um, from all of these projects that I just named, working on a Just Transition Guide, which will help is kind of like a guide um, a written guide that talks communities through how to implement renewable energy projects and like the pros and cons of renewable energy. Um, yeah, the impacts and how communities can get off diesel um, and use this as a transition technology. And I haven't, when I first started doing my master's and applied for my master's in 2012, I was like, there's not a lot of guides out there to kind of show communities how to transition. Um, so that was kind of why I'm just this culmination of, of many years of research. I mean, so you've tied question on us already, but um, what is the significance of a just energy transition for indigenous communities? 
Well, indigenous communities are on the impact and receiving end of massive extraction zones, um, you know, a lot of environmental degradation. So we're living the, the consequences of what a lot of time is unseen by other communities and other urban centers and people that don't live near extraction sites. Um, so, you know, we received the impact and the burden of toxicity and as well as just like sometimes not clean air, clean water, all of the things of what that looks like and as well as cultural, um, just like the cultural and like environmental genocide where it's like really impacting people on a very fundamental level. Um, and so when we have the impacts of extraction, the impacts of climate change, um, but a lot of times we are not receiving the benefits of um, a just transition or utilizing transition technologies to uh, and allow our communities to um, get off of fossil fuels, um, propane, diesel, like very expensive, um, you know, uh, fuels that are, you know, very toxic for people's inhalation and it's, you know, linked to dementia. There's a lot of impact that communities are burdening um, for our oil and gas addiction. And so a just transition looks at transitioning communities as well, not just receiving the impacts, but also receiving some of the benefits of trying to transition and remove our communities away from dependency on fossil fuel extraction. Uh, and so what have been the biggest obstacles for indigenous communities to, to make that just tr transition and get access to clean energy? Um, well, you know, indigenous communities are, like I said, in, in many arenas, like on in crisis, crisis situations where um, not only are we experiencing like the brunt of colonization, so like a lot of undoing of really detrimental government and colonial policy that were, you know, tearing apart the social fabric of communities, governance structures that were completely undone. And so we're rebuilding all of these types of things, you know, being pushed and forcibly removed from land, land encroachment fighting really toxic, you know, developments in and around our communities. So we're dealing with like a slew of already crisis situations on top of poverty because of colonial um, policies that have been implemented that have detrimentally affected our communities. Poverty, high rates of suicide because of just the impacts of trauma of colonization. So we're kind of like, we're battling things on multiple layers. Um, and so when you try to add in just transition on top of that, when you're already dealing with a community of crisis, it's challenging for communities to think like, oh no, we'll just keep this like, diesel or propane and just pay like exorbitant amounts of money to keep the lights on because we're dealing with so many other things of like high you know youth suicide rates or all of the different and like dealing with government like you know foreign governments trying to come in and crouch on more land um basically more land theft and so there's there's a lot of issues that communities are dealing with so um sometimes you don't necessarily see um people from coming from communities wanting to implement solutions or climate solutions because we're already dealing with so much. So that's that's one major issue. Um, so for me, as that's why I decided to do my master's degree in renewable energy and indigenous governance, because I wanted to figure out how can I actually implement? How can I teach myself? How can I teach my community? How can I learn to do this implementation? Because really there's no one else that's gonna do it for us because we don't have you know external governments a lot of times coming in and like let me do a really great project for you and a lot of times when that's happened the projects have been actually detrimental and not beneficial for community because a lot of times people from communities know what the problems are so therefore they they know what the solutions are and so that's it's been a slow transition but like literally as more resources funding knowledge um indigenous experts have come um, you know, out of the woodwork and have like developed um, over the past number of years, you know, as the clean economy or as the renewable energy sector grows, it's such a new sector. So it's, you know, we're, we're kind of building all building up at the same time so we can transition to abate climate change, ideally. Um, I think that that's, a, that's kind of the major issue and like barriers and but right now what we see in like in north of the medicine line in Canada is that we actually see now indigenous communities leading the way where we have up to 2000 2500 different projects across the country um and we have up to 200 large large medium to large scale so revenue generating projects like major wind farms or solar farms um 
things like that where, where communities are either owning outright or partial owning or majority owning projects and then also you know 2300 small small to medium scale projects so like communities like mine that have implemented solar to run one of the you know buildings or multiple buildings or housing and things like that so it's it's happening um but yeah there's definitely challenges that go along with it uh, so you've been operating this space for it seems like about 20 years um what would you say the big biggest differences between when you got your start and now um I think there is now more of a recognition of Indigenous rights and title and that there's been and it's in it's on purpose, but they're in, in North American, you know, collective minds, a lot of the times like the history books have not Indigenous history or and or like the actual history of America or Canada. So there's Indigenous invisibility that's definitely has happened. So now that um, because Indigenous peoples were like pushed out into small reserve areas, you know, had to have land passes to leave. So there was not a lot of times interaction between Indigenous and non-Indigenous settler communities in America and in Canada to a lesser extent. Um, there's more of like a kind of a discussion that's happening and we have certain um, policies and and documents and commissioned reports around, you know, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission that happened here in Canada, um, the, the inquiry on murdered and missing Indigenous women that just um, wrapped up last year. Um, so there's different processes that have happened that bring, and also the residential school um, history that's been hidden from American and Canadian um, textbooks and history books like not taught to people even in my as I grew up in my you know from a young person in school there was just I felt very invisible as an Indigenous person especially when we moved to the city I was most of the time the only Indigenous person in the classroom um, in university settings in high school so it was there was a big invisibility it, the history wasn't taught even around like settler colonial like indigenous relations which is like the very foundation of of Canada um so there's there people do not know their own history um in the benefit of of you know if they're treaty beneficiaries or, or whatever um kind of agreements or lack thereof were kind of like agreed upon you know unseated or st stolen land so there's there that was the basis of what I was coming into in my early 20s and, and was kind of having to do a lot of awareness raising in any space I wanted to around Indigenous issues. Um, so there was a lot of emotional labor, a lot of toll. And so now, um, you know, 20 years, fast forward to 20 years later, um, people do now understand that they're a part of the, this learning, this relearning um, of Indigenous history slash American history. That that this is, you know, a Canadian history is all. In, it's like it's a part of the foundation of these countries, and that every single person that lives in Indigenous territories and which is North America needs to understand the history that they are, you know, building their lives upon. Um, so I think that's one big change that is now coming into people's consciousness. And then like about a decade plus ago, um, or maybe more like 12, 13 years ago, when I would be going to a conference or like going to speak in front of an investors group or doing tours, toxic tours in the tar sands, a lot of people were, I would sit beside say on an airplane or like, you know, anywhere. Well, what do you do? What do you work on? And I'd be like, well, I'm a climate and energy campaigner. And they were like, climate change oh that's interesting that's nice you know it was like it wasn't even in the kind of like it, I felt like I was kind of speaking out to this void of like and there was like a handful of us or just you know a number of us that had dedicated our lives to like bringing climate change awareness and like kind of like ringing the alarm bell that a lot of scientists that you know in indigenous elders and people like through our prophecies and our just knowing of our deep connection to the land were saying like this is going to be a problem and we need to address it. And, you know, we, we had a little bit of that in the eighties and nineties. And then it just like, kind of like, wasn't, wasn't a part of the national dialogues that we were having. And so that felt, that feels really different now. Whereas people like don't dispute climate change unless it's like very few and far between when people actually dispute climate change, but it was like a real thing a decade ago. People were, most people like either didn't care or they disputed it. And so that's, that's a big change as well. Historically, there have been tensions when the conservation sector is not respected or even undermined Indigenous peoples' rights and traditional practices when establishing protected areas. Um, is this an area that you've been engaged with much on? 
Yeah, I mean, as somebody that's worked in environmental and climate justice campaigns to, you know, get a certain outcome in the work that we're doing um, to either raise awareness or get governments or banks or institutions to divest. And, you know, so it's definitely, it's definitely something that you come across, especially, you know, the history of the environmental movement is not one that I would say um, took into consideration indigenous rights and titles in the past, like in the seventies and the eighties, um, indigenous peoples were many times left out of any of the campaigns or any of the strategies or any of the policies that literally affected indigenous peoples on their homelands. And so that is definitely a part of the history of the conservation movement as well. And so there, that's why there is criticisms and um, you know, forcing the conservation movement as well as you know, the environmental movement, which I think has been even more responsive now to those criticisms to say like, oh, from the get go, we have to include indigenous peoples as more than just stakeholders, we have to ensure that they are helping us write the policy, helping us write the strategies, helping us, you know, implement these things, not like an afterthought, not like, oh, we're going to devise all of these, these strategies, and we're going to devise all of these plans. And then we're going to get indigenous quote unquote consent after the fact that's not you know, a respectful, respectful way of knowing and like understanding that indigenous peoples actually, like I said, understand the problems. So therefore we understand the solutions. We understand how um, to implement, we understand how to, what is necessary on the land. Um, and so when you have outsiders doing this, a lot of times, which has been the conservation movement, which has been in the past in the environmental movement, um, it it buds up and, and a lot of times the, strategies and implementation of these policies are lackluster and or do not succeed in the way that they need to because they're from the get-go they have not included indigenous people's input from the beginning and so that is definitely an issue that i've come across for many years and continue to deal with sometimes but i feel like um people have heard that and need to understand and you know starting to understand that they need to stop doing that um type that type of behavior, which is very, um, you know, definitely a colonial be behavior and also like a little bit of a patronizing behavior. So, you know, it, there's, there needs to be deeper levels of respect and understanding of how we work together. What, what would you say is a way to address this? It is really understanding, like, so there needs to be work on the part of, um, you know, conservationists, like white settler conservationists or white settler environmentalists that, you know, have really good intentions of, of wanting to work with communities or wanting to make change in the world, but not necessarily understanding their location of where they are coming into this work. And so, you know, we are literally existing under um, a white colonial and white body supremacist society, um, which, um, which definitely prioritizes the voices of, of people um, that are not marginalized. And so when, you, when you're starting to work with communities that have been traditionally um, oppressed, I think it's important to understand your location and it's important to understand the history um, of the society that you're living on. So it's really about people doing their homework, really understanding you know, where they live, what's what what history took place um, that helps inform people what history took place of the land that you currently live on so I what land do you live on right now uh Ohlone land where so you're based in California yeah uh, Redwood City it's near San Francisco yeah and so like there a lot of people that work on environmental or conservation they don't even a lot of times know the history of the land where they're making their living the land where they like work play love you know all of these things that they don't they're unaware of the history and the kind of genocide or like the forced removal or the like biological warfare like if you can ground yourself in the land where you actually like live and work and make your life that will help inform you to understand the microcosm of the macrocosm of how North America was colonized. And so I think that's like, that's a basic um, foundational premise to like help your heart and body understand what's, what's happened across North America and how these, these ways of being continue to be um, 
perpetuated in even our workspaces now. And I think that's like one step, one solution and an easy solution that someone can feel empowered by of like reading a book, watching a documentary, speaking to an indig local indigenous elder if they have time to speak to you, but also doing realizing that that's your homework and that's your work to do, that it's not, you can't put it on somebody else and expect someone to educate you, but you have to do that work as somebody that has, you know, has these roots in the country that you live in. Um, so I want to pick up on a, a point you made earlier, which is about violence. And uh, this past year has been notable for rising violence against environmental defenders, including indigenous peoples um, in many countries. And I know you've done work on this issue. And so I'd, I'd be interested in your take on what sort of actions can be taken to improve the situation. Yeah, I mean, that's a really heavy one. Um, because some, you know, there's indigenous land defenders across the world and, you know, in, in South America where, you know, that's a really high rate of murder um, for indigenous land defenders. And it feels sometimes hard to know how to sol stand in solidarity with um, people that are so far away, even though we feel the heartbreak of people's you know, very lives being taken just because they're speaking out in the protection of land and the climate and the benefit for for all of us. Um, some of the some of the things that I've done in the past is doing solidarity actions. So figuring out how what's supportive of those communities um, that are experiencing that like crisis time. So whether it be down south, um, doing solidarity actions, um, you know, to raise awareness in North America or um, being a part of documentaries that can document these cases, um, writing articles that can document these cases. Um, and then also looking at whatever the audience and audiences are in like the kind of like choke points that can like help um, put pressure on those local or national governments to know that people are watching. And I think when you get international pressure, that does help alleviate some of the pressure. It doesn't take it all away. But I think the more that we can, with the help of social media, I think that's one of the benefits of social media nowadays is that we don't have to depend on traditional mainstream sources of media. So we can share and reshare, sign petitions, um, send letters to local governments, um, also to our government if there's relationships that are built between those um, governments. So specifically, I'll give a specific example, but one of the, you know, one of the issues was when I was down in Ecuador and there's indigenous peoples um, in the, that were, you know, that sued the Ecuadorian government and then one, and then sued Chevron, then former to formerly Texaco, and then one, but we're not able to hold those um, corporations accountable in those um, countries because they left the country. And so then they for there came came to Canada and then had like a, a legal case in Canada because um, Chevron has assets here in the country. And so that was one way where we kind of did like a cross kind of like awareness raising around um, of that and then doing like actions at Chevron refineries and different sites um, in North America that put pressure on Chevron. So it's, you know, that's been a big battle. I know a lot of people are more aware of, but I think for smaller, it's, it's really challenging to figure out how to support communities. But I think it's really taking note from the communities of how they want support or what they think is strategic or what they think is effective and trying to follow the direction of those communities, I think is, is number one. And then trying to tell friends, families, governments, um, post reposting, resharing, um, the more that people can um, have eyes on it, the better I think and safer people are ultimately. But it's, it's a very challenging one because obviously we're not physically there with our brothers and sisters that are getting murdered when it's actually happening. But raising awareness, I think is, is a huge one. So just two more quick questions. So, so one, the pandemic has been especially difficult for many indigenous communities around the world. Um, how has COVID affected you, your community and your work? Well, it has definitely forced um, the organizations that I work with at Indigenous Climate Action and Sacred Earth Solar is basically working with all of our staff online. And I think that's like par for the coast for most people with COVID. Um, not being able to work 
directly with communities other than through an online platform and online ways of webinar, Zoom, um, all of the things that I think we're all becoming very familiar with. Um, but in terms of COVID impacts, you know, it's, it's, it's a scary thing for, you know, remote Indigenous communities um, because once the, once the virus is in the communities, you know, there, there needs to be, it can either, you know, become like an outbreak or which has detrimental impacts on elders and people that are like higher ages. And our elders are, are seen as like, like a vital source of knowledge and history and oral tradition and language and culture. And so when an elder dies for us, it's, it's a huge loss for the community, for the family, for the nation. And so that's, that's a major issue with the pandemic and why Indigenous peoples, in my opinion, have taken it so seriously and why, um, you know, I can speak specifically to my family. Um, you know, we've had pandemics already within our life um, where the pandemics and the biological warfare that's been waged against Indigenous peoples here in North America has reduced our population by 95% already. So it's very much in our minds and in our bodies of that trauma that's very real and present. And so I think the, the ways in which I act towards the virus, you know, I've seen family members die in front of my eyes from communicable diseases like tuberculosis. Um, so it's, it's a very real um, thing. Whereas I think some, you know, some people in our society in like, you know, Canadian and North American, American society don't take it as seriously because they don't really know what it's like to experience a pandemic in their like recent memory or, you know, the last one we can think of is in 1918 and we know very few people, but um, our people have, you know, uh, we have very, recent stories of, of the impact and how detrimental the impact was of pandemics. So I'd say it affects us a little bit differently. And I think our responses is, is a bit different, but when it gets out of control and the outbreaks happen like it did in Navajo country, because they have such a large population, the, the impact has been has been like utterly heartbreaking. You know, I have one, a, a close friend that, you know, has lost like 15 family members. Um, so it's a, it's a very real thing. And, you know, I have family members back home and my reserve that have gotten very sick. Um, thank God, knock on wood, we haven't lost any elders, but it's, it's definitely kept me up at night, at night, you know, thinking about my aunties and uncles, um, and how much like it would be crushing if that were to be the case. So. Um, well, my last question, which you've kind of already covered, but, um, what advice would you give to someone who wants to be an ally in supporting Indigenous people's rights? Yeah. Um, yeah, I think, you know, one, the, the, the one, one step that I already covered was just like really learning the history and grounding yourself in the, like the land that you, you know, where you are, where you make your life and living and in your home. Um, so knowing that history, there's so many books out there, I think, you know, so many studies, so much research that's been done already. So there's a lot of resources out there. If people look for it, they'll find it. Um, yeah, reading, there's a lot of amazing books written by Indigenous scholars. Um, and then just, you know, if they can, going through like anti-oppression workshops, taking anti-oppression trainings, um, just understanding uh, a little bit deeply of like, of, of the work of like, I think we all need to do on like, you know, our identity of like who we are and how we, you know, our location in the world and then how we bring that into, um, our communities and our families. So I think that's that's a really important because I know a lot there's a lot of people that want to do a lot of good and and that's like a really um an amazing and altruistic uh like need and, and we need that in people like that in the world, but we also need people to really understand deeply um the impacts of colonization and also like their location within that, you know, how they benefited from um, white body supremacy, how they've benefited from land theft and, and just like, and, and within that framework, um, that I think helps you be, become a better ally when you locate yourself within the struggle. Um, how there's impact, like, so when we promote just transition technologies, um, that it's just that we see it as a transition technology because 
ultimately there's impact um, when we take from the land if we're taking too much and so whether it be you know that we that we can't say like renewable energy is the end all be all that it's like the silver bullet just like you know we see people saying like carbon capture and storage is the silver bullet and all of these things where these technologies can actually also be harmful mega dams are harmful so I think it's understanding like kind of having a critical analysis of, you know, also solar, also wind, not saying that, you know, throw the baby out with the bathwater and saying like nothing, because I think that's also can be really harmful, but understanding that the, these technologies that really should have been implemented in the 80s and 90s that were, you know, that existed, um, that we're finally implementing now are, you know, just what they're called, which is like transition technologies. And so like getting us to hopefully, off of fossil fuel extraction off of that but with the mining I think we need to look into more around like where the you know with lithium batteries where the rare earth metals come from and we really need to understand deeper into that you know and not like say like everything's all like bright and shiny but we need to like have more continue to analyze um, the impact regardless of what the technology is and be honest with it because I think what we've seen in mainstream media unfortunately is that kind of a glossing over of impact and then and then not wanting to talk about the impact but we need to talk about the impact to the land um so i think that was an important question that i thought that you had and you brought up and so i just wanted to kind of reiterate that like yeah i agree that it's important that we do that um but we need to figure out how we can use these transition technologies and also like how we can recycle like because there's so much upcycling or recycling that we could do but we haven't learned how to do that with a lot of the old kind of old dinosaur technology and fossil fuel technology that we're now decommissioning like how can we take all of those like heavy metals and like rare earth metals and like all the things of that we've you know taken from the land how can we recycle them and put them into clean tech and I think that's not necessarily being done and that's something that I would hope to see in the future. Manga Bay.